All right. So, what I want to focus on today is, is these four uh, ten film technologies, and these are all made on um, amorphous materials, and we'll use some of those concepts to understand uh, uh, these technology. And most of these are located at the bottom of this curve. So, there's you know there's a, a famous code saying you know there's a lot of uh, the fortune is always at the bottom of the pyramid. So, there's there's a lot of potential over here. The efficiency as of now are all of these 10 film cells, they max out uh, at maximum of 20% uh, for a 6 cell. Most of the organic cells, they max out at you know 10 and 11%. But there's, there's, uh, there's still a lot of uh, uh, potential or black swan kind of uh, options which uh, exist uh, over there. So, let's go look at them uh, one by one. And, uh, so, here are some, let's look at amorphous uh, silicon first. So, most of these amorphous silicon cells, which are shown in that green color or that uh, open green, they line up over here. They max out at efficiencies of uh, around 11 percent. And uh, uh, amorphous silicon, so let me give you some facts about amorphous silicon. So, amorphous silicon. Uh, has a band gap as we saw of around 1.7. Uh, it has a electron mobility of 20. It has a hole mobility maximum of 2. So, question: Which which of these configuration, assuming light is coming from the top, is better for your amorphous silicon uh, solar cell? Is it this PIN which would be better, or would it be? I mean, this is better or this is better? How many people? So, this one is, is much better because most of your carriers are uh, not most, but a large fraction of your carriers would be generated at the very top, especially your blue wavelengths are absorbed at the very top. And uh, if you have an end surface over here, your electrons would be collected over, but your holes have to you know diffuse through over here. And since it's amorphous material, the recombination rates are much higher, mobility is much lower. The, a lot of them will recombine in this configuration. So, this configuration is, is preferred for, uh, for amorphous, uh, typically most uh, amorphous silicon cells, you will see that uh, it's the P material at the top because uh, when the carriers are absorbed at the top, you want to collect the holes uh, very quickly and let the electrons use their mobility to travel till here and then get collected. So, this is counterintuitive of what we saw in, in crystalline silicon, right? So, I'm saying over here that uh, amorphous silicon is, is mostly configured like this. Last lecture, we saw that crystalline silicon is configured like this. So, why is crystalline silicon like that and why, why is this ambiguity among? So, the reason crystalline silicon has been like that is because this P plus region has been uh, created typically by uh, by this backside field which comes from your aluminum. So, uh, because of this aluminum layer, you get this P plus uh, layer uh, for free. That's why, and the difference between your uh, the ratio of your electrons and holes mobility in the case of silicon, it's four. Over here, it's like ten, and also the mobilities are much higher over here. But even for this. Uh, P uh, plus on the top and N plus on the bottom would have been better. And most of when people are starting to use this uh, backside passivation, and you actually don't use that uh, uh, field from aluminum, you use uh, aluminum oxide or a, nit a dielectric layer to create that field. So, in that case, in fact, uh, even in this case, uh, P uh, on the top and N becomes uh, better. So, <coughs> so, this is a typical how a sim single junction uh, amorphous silicon uh, cells looks like. And again, it's, it's a very simple process play flow to uh, make this. So, you start with either a, a plastic or a glass substrate. And the first thing you put is your metal electrode. And it's a transparent uh, metal electrode. So, it's a metal oxide, typically a zinc oxide or a tin oxide. And then you grow these uh, different uh, PIN layers, and they're all grown by 
a CVD process typically, which grows all three of them together. So you grow, you put in a tool and grow PIN layers, and then you cap it up with uh, uh, another oxide or simply cap it up uh, with a material. And that's how you uh, get this set. And then you, essentially the way it's shown now is then you invert it and then you get uh, light. But efficiency of these, uh, most of these amorphous silicon uh, crystalline cells, they saturate out at 8% because of the reason that uh, we just discussed about uh, all the bad things about amorphous material. The mobility is low, recombination is higher. So if you use a thicker film, it doesn't really give you an uh, increase, in, uh, increase in your cell efficiency. So the thing that people have tried, and not with not with too much success, I'm take showing this from a you know a two uh, two thirty seven uh, course is that uh, people have tried to go tandem even in amorphous uh, silicon uh, uh, cells. So they have tried to combine this amorphous silicon, which has a band gap of one point seven, with either amorphous silicon germanium, or they have tried to combine it uh, with a uh, multi-crystalline cell and uh, again the when you make a tandem cell the two important things to keep in mind are uh, you need to choose the band gap in the right way so the upper material should have a band higher band gap so it's typically amorphous silicon and then on the lower material you have an option of either using a, a multi-crystalline silicon or amorphous uh, silicon germanium and for all these tandem cells, since they are connected in uh, series, you need to match their current. So you need to choose the thickness of these layers such that uh, their currents are uh, matched. Uh, shown here is this uh, configuration, which is also gone as a micro morph cell, or uh, uh, it's a tandem of amorphous and microcrystalline. So your uh, uh, amorphous silicon is a very thin layer which is on the top and the below is microcrystalline uh, uh, based uh, cell. And they're again grown in the same CVD tool. It's just that you grow this at a higher temperature so it becomes microcrystalline. And the top one is grown at a lower temperature so it's still amorphous. And they, when you take a SEM or TM, they don't look very pretty. These are amorphous materials so they look something like this. <coughs> One of the main uh, uh, problems with these amorphous silicon based cells is that they degrade with light. So if you take amorphous silicon cell and let it lie in light for a large period of time, your efficiency or your power will degrade as a function of time. And this degradation is, is even more severe when you have these tandem cells where you have a tandem of uh, amorphous silicon and microcrystalline. So it's like you know you're running in a relay race and if one of your runners is slow it becomes it brings everybody down so if you connect things in tandem and one of them degrades it degrades the whole thing even more so that's why uh, uh, your uh, your efficiency falls or your delivered power falls as you soak it uh, uh, in sunlight the good thing is that it can be recovered back so if you expose it to a hot temperature again that efficiency uh, comes back so the reason which occurs is is because uh, sorry the reason it occurs is because in this amorphous silicon you have these uh, lot of hydrogen states which are hydrogen molecules which are bonded uh, to your uh, all the dangling bonds and when you expose it to light uh, that bond breaks and uh, you create more defect states but if you again uh, go to higher temperature it gets recovered back so it's a uh, it's a known problem in this light uh, induced degradation is, is typical of all these thin film technologies. So most of these amorphous materials, they, uh, the bonds tend to break if you soak them to sunlight for a long time. So they show much higher degradation uh, as compared to crystalline uh, solar cells. And then the way people have been manufacturing this is you know, using large tools. So this, uh, this is the same tool that I showed you for display. Most of these people try to modify uh, these display-based tools, which are huge tools, could make panels of uh, 5.6 meters square size, but uh, uh, at the same time, it adds to your capex. And just like we did a bill of material analysis uh, 
for the iPhone, people actually do bill of material analysis for each of the process steps that you are doing, how much material cost is coming. You know, it's, it's really counting the pennies, you know, how much utilities is there, how much rent is on the facility, everything. So most of these amorphous silicon is uh, uh, cells, they first of all max out at efficiency of 10%. Uh, if you need more than that, you need to go to this complex structure, but then it degrades very fast with light. So your light uh, induced degradation can reduce your efficiency by 20% again. And then it requires these large and big tools. So there was a lot of action in this field around 2007, 2008, but uh, since then it has all cooled down because of all these limitations. So amorphous silicon is, uh, is no longer a leading candidate uh, for uh, sensor uh, technology. So because of all these reasons, people thought, you know, let's look at another material. And uh, that's what I will, I'll describe next. All right, so the next thing, uh, if you look at again this chart, and I love this chart because you know it summarizes so much of information. So the next thing beyond this uh, amorphous silicon that you have in efficiency is this cat tail based technology. And it has been researched for a long time, uh, and then it started to commercialize around 2000. And the company was started to commercialize this was uh, First Solar. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, cost, it's uh, again if you it's if you compare it, it's uh, much cheaper as compared to crystalline silicon. Even much cheaper as compared to uh, SIGs. Uh, uh, and uh, this is what uh, you know first solar typically shows. So it shows that you know it has been able to reduce it. Uh, even further and now they sell it for around 60 cents uh, per watt and a lot of it has come through efficiency improvement uh, some of through some of it has come through you know uh, scale uh, scaling up their plant improving their throughput uh, and uh, so on <coughs> so cattle uh, if you look at uh, the material itself it's a direct uh, band gap material and it has a band gap of uh, 1.5, which is, you know, falls within that optimum peak. So your optimum efficiency of a single crystalline solar cell is between, you know, uh, 0.6 to 1.5 cents for band gap. So the band gap is nearly ideal, um, and it has a very high absorption coefficient as well. So you don't need too thick of a material. It's a strong uh, direct uh, band gap uh, absorber. So people have been mucking around with it since a long time. You know, they, uh, the first thing that you need uh, to make this cattle cell is that, uh, again, you can't dope it too high. So you need that heterostructure uh, contact to uh, extract the electron. So the way it works is you have a cattle layer, and then you have a cat sulfide layer on the top. And they form this type two kind of lineup. So your uh, electrons which are generated uh, in your uh, uh, in your uh, cattle could be easily collected by this uh, cat sulfide layer and uh, um, so again it falls back to that uh, initial description that you know that pn junction is a very limited definition of a solar cell uh, a more complete definition is that you all you need is a photovoltaic action so you need a uh, density of state bottleneck, so you need a band gap, and you need this selective contact to separate your electrons and here. So the way the selective contact over here is made by is by having this uh, cat sulfide uh, cat tail uh, heterojunction. So this too has been you know played around till till the 1990s. People were they already knew all these concepts and they were playing around with it. But the efficiency never used to exceed uh, more than 10 or 11 percent. What first solar did was they figured out uh, a very good way to passivate the cell, and uh, you know that reduced some of these defects that you get uh, in uh, in this amorphous uh, silicon uh, material. And they went to uh, they now have a cell efficiency of uh, 16.5 with this uh, uh, cell. And what they did was uh, they, they figured out this treatment that's a cat chloride based treatment. And that they first deposit the whole 
stack and then anneal it uh, in this gas and it improves uh, your uh, lifetime and your properties of this cattail material uh, uh, very uh, significantly and they didn't you know publish not they still haven't published it but they didn't even reveal it for a long time so for a long time it was a well kept secret how does their uh, cell uh, work and they're the only supplier which sells this uh, in in volume <coughs> So that, that's about uh, cattail. So, but cattail has uh, these uh, two very big problems. That is, the two letters in cattail, each of them is a problem. Uh, terrelium is a rare earth metal, and uh, it's in fact, this is your plot showing you know, how much uh, uh, is the quantity available, and you see that uh, terrelium is right at you know, the bottom. It's one of the rarest metals. Uh, so, one of the concern always with the technology is that, you know, if terrelium becomes short in supply, the cost will go up, but that so far hasn't happened. They have been able to find newer and newer uh, resources. There's a whole state in China apparently which has a huge uh, amount of terrelium. So, it was, uh, you know, said to be one of the bottlenecks, but so far it hasn't uh, been so. Uh, another thing which is a bottleneck is, is cadmium is a poisonous uh, uh, material. Uh, EU has this specification called, uh, you know, restriction of hazardous uh, substance, so it comes under that. In fact, these cells are not allowed to be sold in Japan because they need special recycling ones. So, you know, they have, these cells typically fail like a, with a lifetime of 20 years. So, after 20 years, you need to recycle them and, um, uh, in fact, first solar includes a five cent charge of in their panel cost for this uh, recycling, but still some countries uh, don't allow these uh, cells at all. So, and also their efficiency maxes out around 16 percent. That's the maximum people have been uh, able to go. So, first solar, including first solar, they have been looking into alternate to cattail. And they, in fact, have a big group in Oakland, around 80 people who were trying to look at uh, this uh, alternate technology, which is uh, uh, the SIGS-based uh, solar cell. So the next, if you look up again this in this efficiency letter, the next thing after CATEL is these uh, SIGS-based uh, solar cell. So by uh, SIGS, what I mean is uh, uh, copper, indium, gallium, uh, selenium. So, what it SIGS uh, is, you can have any combination of these uh, materials in your group 11, 13, and 16. So, you could pick copper, then indium, gallium, so CIG, and then either of these sulfur, selenium, thallium, C, and all of them will give you a direct uh, band gap material. The good thing about SIGS is that you can also tune your uh, indium and gallium ratio. So, it's typically copper, indium, gallium and then two atoms of selenium. And you could use that to tune your band gap from, uh, from 1 to around 1.2. Uh, and this is again made in a very similar way. You start with a glass, you put, deposit the six layer and then you have the scat sulfide on the top and then another TC on the top. So, you could make these things either on glass or you could make them on sheets of metal, you could even make them on, uh, the starting material could be glass, it could be a flexible material, and uh, it could be even a sheet of metal. So, there are all the startups uh, which are in the six space, they have, each of them has a unique process and each of them has a unique starting material uh, to make uh, these uh, six uh, materials. The bottleneck for this is that it requires uh, four elements. So, six means C, I, G, S. So, there are at least four elements. And you, these have to be sputtered uh, uh, in a fixed ratio across that big panel. And that's one of the main bottlenecks that how do you uh, deposit on a big panel that same stoichiometry of these four elements, which all have to be sputtered. So, uh, uh, it's actually a good experiment to do in a university lab where you uh, where you have four different elements and you have a sputter which is a multi-target sputter and you'll get all different combination on one wafer 
and you can measure each of those and you know publish a nice chart which has all kind of efficiencies but if you manufacture this in an industry you know you need to get the same stoichiometry across that whole panel so each of these companies which is you know a lot of them are based here in the bay area each of them has um, uh, what they are they're essentially uh, either a process or a tool company, Mars Cell, a solar company, but each of them has a different process to deposit this uh, SIGs uh, material. And some of them are still surviving, but you know, uh, a lot of them are, are no longer, uh, this slide is from 2010, so a few of them are actually just on the brink of uh, collapse. This one actually went bankrupt. This one was acquired by uh, another Chinese company for at least one-tenth of the amount that was raised uh, in terms of venture capital and few of them other are also on the brink of collapse. So <coughs> it's again choosing the right material, choosing the right process is, is very important in these penicillin solar materials because it's, it's all about can you make them at a low cost and do you have a roadmap to increasing the efficiency further at the same cost. So that's, those are very important uh, things uh, to answer for all these uh, Tenslim uh, technologies. So the final thing I want to describe, and I actually like this a lot. Uh, it's at the very bottom of this pyramid, and it has the lowest efficiency, you know, organic-based uh, uh, photovoltaic cell. They really suck in terms of efficiency. The maximum uh, you get is around 10%, but there's a lot of potential uh, in these uh, Thing. So the first thing we need to understand is is how it uh, works. So you know, um, this is the value proposition for uh, organic photovoltaics that you know you can get these organic molecules, which are you know a way routinely used in uh, in factories and laboratories. And you know, there's a lot of abundance, so there's no scarcity. You can actually manufacture them as you want. Very low cost. Efficiency is maximum 8%, but if you can make them very cheaply, and if you actually achieve a module efficiency of 30%, you could achieve a grid uh, parity. So it's very important to understand how it works. So for a lot of time, people try to generate, get electricity out of these organic uh, molecules. And they applied a lot of current, they applied a very high electric field, but you know, you could never get efficiency of maximum of you know, 0.1%, no matter what you did. And uh, the reason is that it, uh, when these, these uh, uh, electron and holes uh, in organic molecules, they're not generated like electron and holes separate, they're generated as a exciton uh, pair. So, what people discovered then was, you know, instead of having that one layer, again, this heterojunction, if you use this heterojunction like this, where you have a donor material, which has a higher, elect uh, lower electron affinity, and a acceptor uh, layer, which has a higher electron affinity, you could immediately get, uh, people started to get efficiencies of, you know, one, two, three, four, five percent by just applying these two layers uh, instead uh, of uh, one. So let me describe you uh, uh, it in a little more detail, how does it uh, work. So this, having these two layers in this uh, heterojunction is critical for having, making a organic uh, based uh, photovoltaic cell. So you need to have this donor and acceptor layer, typically made of two different organic uh, molecules and they need to be aligned in this way such that the donor has a, a lower electron affinity as compared uh, to acceptor. And the way it works is that when, a, when an incoming photon comes, it generates, uh, uh, the first thing it does is it generates this electron and her, her whole pair, but this is generated uh, as a exciton and it has a certain efficiency of let's say 15%. Uh, and then it, uh, you know, then it, uh, uh, and the absorption length for these is typically around uh, 100 nanometer for these uh, organic uh, molecules. And then immediately, so this generation happens very fast. It happens on a time scale of 10 to the power minus 10, minus 16 seconds. And then it relaxes to this intermediate state, which is a, 
which is called uh, excitation, exciton relaxation, and this it forms this also very fast in 10 to the power minus uh, 30 seconds, and then this is essentially a stable state, and uh, it has a certain binding energy, and to break the state, you what you need to do is take this exciton and diffuse it to this heterojunction. And that heterojunction, and so this is the main uh, limiting step that you need to, gen you have generated that exciton, that's okay. But now you need to take this to this heterojunction. And so it has to diffuse through this uh, diffusion length. And that's typically, you know, 15, uh, 5 or uh, between 5 to 20 nanometer. And only if it's within that diffusion length, it will diffuse to this, uh, uh, this uh, hetero interface. And when it does, then it actually breaks up, very separates this exciton state, so separates very easily. It, uh, it gives away this uh, electron to this other guy, and the hole very nicely goes to the other contact. And this happens at a very high efficiency as well. So this is also a very fast process, and it's also very efficient. So the only bottleneck or you know, the overall efficiency of this organic uh, solar cell is, uh, is limited by generating this uh, exciton in a region of you know, 10 to 20 nanometer from this interface. So all which is generated within this 10 to 20 nanometer of this interface is absorbed with you know, almost a uh, uh, way higher quantum efficiency, but everything away is essentially just, just not uh, collected. So, but this, you know, this means, you know, there's, there's something which is nice and, you know, we could uh, engineer it to, you know, some solutions uh, around it. So, uh, if you look at uh, the overall efficiency, it's essentially a, a multiple of these, all these different efficiency, you know, for absorption, then excitation diffusion, and then you know separation of these uh, excitation and then their collection and all of these others are you know either 100% or at least half but the limiting step is this excitation diffusion and that happens only in the region of uh, twice the diffusion length from this interface and this is what limits the efficiency of these uh, cells so if you measure uh, if you measure like you know what is the absorption what is the efficiency of these cells you see, you know, that most of these are, these are not limited by, you know, the how easily you collect or recombine or anything. They're limited by how much you're able to absorb within that uh, diffusion. And so your absorption for different wavelengths is, where, is what limits your efficiency of these uh, cells. So <coughs> there have been, uh, you know, a lot of ideas uh, which people are uh, working on to improve this uh, organic uh, photovoltaic uh, efficiency. Mm -hmm. So remember, most of that uh, uh, useful uh, electron and holes that we collect are generated at that interface between our uh, donor and the acceptor layers uh, in this uh, organic photovoltaic cells. So what people have been trying to do, at least in the research community, is is trying to maximize that interface. So again, this is one of the devices that tries to leverage that interface and tries to maximize it. So you can collect uh, as many of these excitons uh, and break them into electron and hole and collect them. So one way to maximize that interface is that have this highly folded uh, heterojunction. So essentially these are randomly located uh, uh, acceptors and donors, but you want to connect all the acceptors on one side and all the donors on the other side. So this is one scheme of uh, doing that. And a lot of uh, dye synthesis based methods uh, try to generate this kind of uh, profile between your uh, donor and acceptor molecules. The other way to do it is have a controlled uh, junction. Again, you want to maximize that interface so you can collect that interface is what breaks this exciton into electron and hole. So again, you want to maximize that interface. So one way to do this is have this regular uh, controlled, uh, uh, you know, heterojunction uh, uh, between uh, uh, your uh, acceptors and donors. But these are all active areas uh, of research. But as such, it, the technology is pretty neat. Uh, uh, and it, it is cheap uh, as to start with, and then you can, you have further uh, uh, room for optimization. That's why you see a lot of uh, 
there's been quite a few faculty at Stanford who who work uh, on on organic crop innovation. These materials you could uh, deposit them either by a PVD kind of process that gives you good uh, film quality, but it uh, it wastes a lot of these materials. So a lot of that material would be uh, you know deposited on your mask. Another way to do it is you know have this roll to roll coater. So these are big uh, uh, you know the material the sputter material is like a roll and it's sputtered on this big film uh, and then there are uh, other techniques as well like dye based uh, or solution based uh, processing so all of these are, are uh, ways you can make uh, deposit these uh, uh, organic layers and make uh, organic uh, photovoltaic uh, cells 